but the idea is generally the same as that for some reason you found a reason to make this match different, right? Maybe it's the state championships and you build for this. Maybe it's a specific kid. Maybe it's because a college coach is watching. Mm -hmm. Um, But for some reason you made this match different and you jacked up your anxiety level because of that. And because you had such a high anxiety level, you performed really poorly. So it's like, how do you make every single, how do you make every single match the exact same where you're just going out there to handle business? It's like, okay, I shake hands and I'm just doing the same thing. I'm wrestling because the more you can keep those things similar, generally the better off you're in a performance. That was Ben Askren and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by our longtime sponsor, simplyfaster.com. There's two items I'd like to talk to you about today that you can find in Simply Faster's online store. Whether you're a coach or an athlete, these are both things that you'll find highly useful as tools in your training toolbox. The first is blood flow restriction training methods. And after hearing about blood flow restriction training for years now, as well as the results that athletes are getting with it, especially in, for example, uh, lactate sports like swimming, 100 meter freestyle, and not only hearing of that, but also seeing how much some swimmers had liked that type of training method, I knew I had to start trying it out myself. So uh, I've been utilizing the air bands. I really enjoy it, both the, uh, the feeling while I'm actually training with them, as well as seeing the visual result of spending time training with the methods and then the strength result. Uh, they've been a really cool training tool, and I would definitely recommend checking into air bands. Uh, SimplyFaster.com also has B Strong brand blood flow restriction. The second item is the VMAX Pro. And this is a new option for velocity-based training, barbell tracking. It provides valuable load-based data, including speed in all phases of a lift, and it delivers key metrics such as power, velocity, distance, as well as duration of effort. The VMAX Pro system measures any lift you can think of. It's portable, durable, and intuitive. You can check out these two items and much more at our sponsor, simplyfaster.com's online store. Let's get on to the show. I always enjoy learning about elite talent in sport. In training athletes, uh, it's a lot of fun to learn about the physical uh, training, the speed development, the power, the vertical jumping, the skill and biomechanics. These are things that I've talked about a lot on this podcast and really enjoy. But I think sometimes we take for granted just how important it is that we have uh, the mental process down, the creative process down that gives elite athletes more movement options, more weapons, more ways to get the job done. It's easy to get sucked into this overly structured system. Of performance and then fail to nurture the individual creative and mental processes that are going to help athletes succeed as the level of competition rises. On the show today, to share with us about creativity in sport and developing an elite competitor's mindset is Ben Askren. Ben is a former mixed martial artist and wrestler, and he's now a wrestling coach amongst his other ventures. Ben is one of the most successful wrestlers and MMA fighters of all time. He's known for his unique style and technical skills. Ben had a historic NCAA career in wrestling with a 157-8 overall record, and he went undefeated his final two years with an 87-0 record. As an MMA fighter, Ben was the former Bellator and won welterweight champion. He was undefeated for over a decade before competing in the UFC championship, and he had a final win-loss record of 19-2. Ben has co-founded Askren Wrestling Academy with his brother Max, and they currently operate five gyms. On today's podcast, Ben is going to take us through his early life in sport and when he made the transition from a multi-sport athlete to a specialist in wrestling, and then he'll go into some of the grounds that led to some big creative leaps in his process and ability as an athlete, and then he's going to share about the balance between creativity and structure in the development of young athletes. Ben is also going to share lots of information on developing one's practice of mental composition and resiliency, and especially as it pertains to competition. Ben will just speak on how he has this love for competition, something that I don't believe I had so much as an athlete. And hearing him talk about that and everything else on this podcast has given me such an appreciation for his level of talent and ability and how he goes about his own coaching process. This was a really fun show with a lot of really unique insights that are helpful for any coach or athlete and I think are really important in considering that long-term process and then all the, the bases to cover when we're talking about elite athlete performance. That all being said, let's get on to episode 268 with Ben Askren. Ben, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have you here, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I, funny enough, I, something I think we have in common is um, we're both from Wisconsin, and we both played disc golf. Do 
you ever get uh, any rounds of disc golfing in still these days? Well, uh, I actually played one time last week. Yeah, I, I don't really like playing in the cold, and now we actually have a tiny bit of snow. And so I had a friend come over and play. I, I, I had my hip surgery done in September 1st. So I had really kind of not played too much since then. But I'm good to go now. I threw. I enjoyed it. Now, obviously, we'll, we won't play much over the winter. But when spring comes back, I'll be re- ready to bomb some. Yeah, I remember I used to play when I went to grad school in Wisconsin lacrosse, playing in the snow, and I lost so many discs under the snow. You can't, yeah, you can't <laughs> play in the snow. And people always say, well, is it cold? No, it's because if you're there are discs, they're very narrow. So even if there's this much snow and it, it knifes in, you, you're never, ever going to find the disc, <laughs> and you're going to be out there tortured walking around in the snow pointlessly. So you do not want to play disc golf in the snow. Yeah, no, it definitely, I think it improved my attention to detail, trying to find that little crack. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> just right? kidding. Or you throw the disc that just wouldn't, wasn't very, you know, just throw a, a bright putter that's, anyways, I don't want to yeah. belabor disc golf, but uh, it's it's good to have you here, man. Uh, so I think you're you're still in Wisconsin, right? Like, I mean, probably could have gone a lot of places, but I think you're you're still in Wisconsin and, and doing some work there with wrestling academies. Yeah, so, uh, well, I left Wisconsin after high school in 2002. I graduated, and I went to Missouri for seven years, so it was there for five years of college, plus two years coaching, and then I coached Arizona State for two years. And then after that, in 2011, I had won my Bellator title. Or was it 2010? I don't know. It was a long time ago. And one of those years, I think it was 2010, I won my Bellator championship. And so when the collegiate season wrapped up in 2011, it was like, hey, this is probably something I, I should be doing full time I should probably put some time and effort towards this and I you know I didn't know how much longer I would fight for but there was a really good gym in Wisconsin that was that was the real reason I moved back obviously our academies are starting at a similar time and that that was awesome also what actually inspired you to make that jump I'm sure you've talked about this plenty of times before but to make the jump from wrestling to MMA fighting yeah it was just uh kind of a natural progression for me a lot of people, well, and it, it wasn't as mainstream as it is currently, right? It was, um, it was getting to that point. You know, fighting started in 1993. It was relatively popular for a couple of years. And then it kind of hit a dark period where there was uh, not a lot of regulation. So lots of states were banning it. And then while I was, while I was in college, the, the Ultimate Fighter came back on Fight TV. And it started really gaining a heavy amount of popularity. So when I was done wrestling in, the, in March of, 2007 you know I, I considered going straight into fighting because it was just something that intrigued me and i thought hey the olympics aren't all that far away it's a little over a year so how, I, you know i've been having this as my a dream for many many years so let's let's follow this through and then so i wrestled in the olympics obviously didn't go i did make the olympic team but the olympics specifically did not go very well for me for me it was like okay let's try fighting and if i don't like it or i'm not good at it i'll just i'll switch back to wrestling and i could do that right and i'm a I have essentially a four-year window until the next Olympics, and you know, obviously, the rest is history, right? I enjoyed, I enjoyed fighting. Uh, I did relatively well at it, and so I ended up sticking with fighting. And I never really went back to wrestling. I, you know, I coach wrestling, I'm around wrestling all the time, but I never went back to competitive wrestling. Yeah, and so that that's one thing that I really wanted to, uh, I guess, the first official introductory question of sorts, and because I think people who are familiar with you and your fighting style, it's 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 different. It's very very creative versus I guess and and that's a big topic on the show in general is just creativity versus structure but to kind of spearhead that I'd like to get into what is your athletic background so what things where did you start with this whole athletic world and how did that eventually funnel into eventually specializing in wrestling yeah so I did everything when I was younger and there weren't quite as many sports available back then I, I think we're the exact same age so you know there was soccer and football and uh maybe a little swimming once in a while maybe a couple of basketball camps wrestling baseball like those were kind of like the main sports at least in my era that you played and i and i played them all in fifth grade i decided to quit doing baseball to do more wrestling in the spring so you know march april may and i was just really drawn to the individuality of wrestling i was drawn to the fact that i i determined my own path that i wasn't reliant on my teammates to uh, you know, do good things in order for me to win. I, I really love the aspect of it. Obviously, I love the combativeness, which I already mentioned. And then all the way till my freshman year of high school, I played football. And that was kind of when I'm like, okay, all I, all I really want to do is wrestling. And at that point in time, no one was doing that. That was like, 
that was totally unheard of. And so, but I, you know, I made the decision to do that and it, it obviously it paid off and I was really happy doing it. And, you know, I, I was, no one made the decision for me. It was me making the decision that that was what I want to do with my life. So that being unheard of that you decided to specialize in wrestling and not do other sports. Yeah, cor- oh, correct. Interesting. I mean, well, I mean, really, really I think all specialization was much more limited at that point. In yeah. Time. Yeah, of course. Uh, but in, re- in, in wrestling, it wasn't even really feasible, right? I, my, I was lucky enough that my dad bought me, um, my dad bought me a wrestling mat, and that you know I had to really find partners to find partners to go with, you know. And it wasn't like, hey, there's a you know right on my my club. We operate year round. If you want to show up in July, we'll be open. If you want to show up in August, we'll be open. Right, wherever you want to show up, you can show up. And then that wasn't that wasn't accessible back then. It was like I had to really find people. I actually, just did a mental Monday on you know finding people to train with because Mm -hmm. it it wasn't it wasn't a thing and i wanted to be a thing but it wasn't so i had to kind of do it for myself yeah that's interesting because i know i mean nowadays i mean this is 20 years later which is crazy sometimes i look back and i think it's crazy that yeah all these years have passed since you and i were in high school and those types of things and now it's almost the opposite problem on some level people probably specializing far too early and i know there's different age brackets where you can go through those. I think the old Russians did a good job of saying your first entry point should be exposure here. Then this age, you should specialize. What, what age did they say? I'm curious. I, I, I don't mind it. I don't, I don't even know for wrestling, to be honest. I, I think. Oh, I, they said they said for different sports. Yeah, they have different sports oh. that like, okay, if you're, if you're a gymnast, this is your first, first exposure to the sport. And then this age is where you can start doing only gymnastics. And they have that mm. for all these different sports. And so I'm, I'm curious what your take is on. Like the wrestlers in your young, you know, young age wrestlers in your academy. I mean, are these kids doing other sports these days versus twenty years ago? What's what's that landscape looking like right yeah. now? Well, we have we have people who do everything, right? I mean, we have all all the different possibilities across the board. And I, I would say, I would say that eleven to age fourteen, some somewhere in that thing, is when kids can finally say like. Hey, this is what I want to do. I mean, like me, right? Well, when mm-hmm. I was in fifth grade and I was 11, I said, Hey, th- this is what I want to do. I want to wrestle and I want to quit baseball and I want to go do this more. And my parents said, Okay. So I always say, like, I, I try to not let the parents push the kid into more participation. Like, I want it to be the kid's choice. And when the kid says, I want to do this, they could do it. You know, I know, I know there's certain people who say you should never specialize. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, strong, I strongly disagree with that. You know, JJ Watt is one. And I, I'm very annoyed by that because when you're when you're six five two ninety, it's probably pretty easy to play any sport and be relatively good at it. But for me, you know, this was what I wanted to do. I made this decision. If someone would try to tell me that's what I could do, I would be pissed, right? This is what I want to do. This isn't what someone else wants me to do, and I should be able to do what I want with my life. And then, you know, then if I look at my academy, you know, there's certain kids who going into their freshman year, they're they're 92 pounds. Well, what other sports can they play? Mm-hmm. I mean, they can maybe run successfully, but they're going to get killed with football. They're going to be too small for almost all these other sports. And so a lot, of, a lot of the kids who do choose to specialize in wrestling are those really small kids. Be- and it's strictly for the reason that they're just, they struggle at everything else. They don't get any playing time because they're tiny. And so for those kids, you know, if they want to make that decision to specialize. I don't see why not. So do I think any kid should be forced to specialize? The answer is no. But do I think a kid should be forced to do everything? And I think the answer is also no. I think the kids should be able to make their own decision of what they want to do. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it can be very easy to be myopic, like to just to, to, to as we counter the norm, because I mean, kids don't play enough these days. They don't do enough sports early these days before they do specialize. And to counter that yeah. saying, oh, well, you should never. I mean, I think at certain sports, there is a time like you did. You chose this is what I want to do. And it. I kind of think too, like sports that are very extremely skill heavy. I mean, football is, but as I've talked to other coaches, there's some sports that yeah. almost you have to start earlier and you have to like, like baseball being an example. There's just the skill of yeah. baseball is just so insane compared to even compared to football. Like people who are, have less early experience can have some success just by being physical beasts. But and I would think wrestling too. I mean, just the, the, all the things that go into being a good wrestler, the proper yeah. reception and all the moves. And that skill library, it does seem, again, I don't have the chart in front of me, but it seems like a sport that you, you may potentially want to look at if you this is what you want to do, that being more of a specialist thing than, like, I think football players should do track, like, but that's yeah. different. It's, I think it's just a little different for some of these different no, sports. No, you, 
Yeah, you nailed it. Some of the skill motions for certain sports aren't nearly as hard as uh, other sports, right? And football being an obvious one, you know. And but yeah, I still have had guys like I had one guy who was uh, who was very into gymnastics and he did some other things, and he didn't choose to like go all into wrestling. I think he was maybe fifteen or sixteen. And I remember I got off a plane and I had a text from him and he said, Hey, do you still think you could be a division one wrestler? And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, I told him that I think, Hey, you know, this is something that is in, you, you can do. And he said, okay. Cause I, you know, I made the decision to quit gymnastics. I want to wrestle. And then he was, like I said, he was 15 or 16. It wasn't like he was young at all. And uh, yeah, he put the time in now. He, he's a division one wrestler. He's doing, he's doing really, really well. Yeah. Gymnastics is an awesome feeder sport. You can get like so much out yeah. of that. And I could see that being kind of a cool little interesting link. So I do want to ask you, we talked about your background a little bit, but I want to ask you, and I always mm-hmm. like asking athletes, this is who were like big time mentors early in your athletic career, coaches, mentors, and what kind of impact did they have on you that you felt helped form who you were? Yeah, well, I, I had so many. Um, I think, you know, I was pretty lucky to have good coaches all, all the way through. My biggest one being probably my high school coach who I was very close with, and he still coaches the academy just. He was super dedicated. He loved wrestling. You know, I had him as a partner a lot of times. And man, I, I can't tell you how far that went to making me who I am today. Yeah, in terms of your more, um, I guess, creative style, was there any coach that helped spur that? Or was that you? Like just you you making that decision yeah. and taking that upon yourself? There, there was influences. I mean, a big influence was my freshman year of college, a guy named Mike Ironman, who was, he himself was still competitive as a wrestler but he was also kind of coaching at that time at Missouri. That one was really helpful, but a lot of it was me and then my teammates, right? My teammates were kind of spurring the innovation that happened. Um, we were all kind of bouncing ideas off each other saying, what about this? What about that? How do we solve this? How do we fix that? And it was one of those things where it's just kind of the group working towards, hmm. uh, you know, a common goal. Yeah. So it was more, more of you at deciding in the group. That's interesting. Cause I think that I it just brings up an interesting point as to, you know, if we're going to innovate as athletes and be allowed to be creative, what what is the coach's role? And then can the coach be a facilitator to facilitate these yeah. ideas amongst a group setting rather than being, I guess, a dictator of sorts? Yeah. Well, have, haven't they proved that that's where most innovation comes? I, I'm not I, I could not recall the exact studies, but I feel like there have been some studies which prove that there's a, a gigantic amount more information when there is greater communication among like all of the parties hmm. as opposed to just top down communication. I, I'm, I'm blanking on what the studies are, but I know I know I've read that somewhere. I'm sure I'm sure it's true. I would love to if you are, if you remember it and, and want to send it to me, I'll throw that in the show notes. But I always love those just where, where business and life in general you know, yeah. collides with sports. Those are just these great things that we can use to I mean, teach athletes about life, use life to teach about sport. It's always uh, it's always good to be able to do that. I know, um, yeah. I think I, I've heard you mention, or in terms of, like, how how did you study to, I guess I could say be more creative, but how did you study to find solutions to, to become better? I mean, were you studying your opponents or were you studying, like, elites? Yeah. Like, how did that break down? It was, it was all it was all study of elites, and it, it wasn't really easy, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever I was doing it. You had to really dig deep, but it was, it was all study of elites. It was, you know, study the best guys. And it's like, oh, what, what are they doing that I could potentially do or that I could use for my advantage? That's kind of how I was thinking of it. It's just that from, from that thought process. And, you know, that's kind of, and then obviously it, I ended up creating new solutions to a lot of the problems, but a lot of it was stealing from pe- people who were better than me and who've already done it. Got it. So even more than studying an opponent, per se you would you would just continually study the best or the best I barely, yeah I, I barely ever studied opponents that would that would be really rare for me i kind of saw it as a waste of time because you know from what i kind of saw is like someday what's going to be my end form right what hmm. i end up being is is not highly tied to me needing to win this match on saturday or you know or whenever and so if I was just more focused on that interim goal of what I was going to become, that the matches would take care of themselves. So I kind of want to know, hey, is this guy, you know, does he have a really great single leg? Is there one or two things maybe I should be aware of? But more more often than not, it was just me worried about, like, like I said, my, my kind of, I don't know about my end form or what I would eventually become. Yeah, so in terms of, I know you, you said you have wrestling academies. And so when you're teaching mm-hmm. your young wrestlers, I wanted to ask you a few questions about this is, well, yeah. one, do you do you teach them to 
study their opponent at all then or, or how where, how does that break no, it down with no never. oh <laughs> interesting yeah i know we, we don't really talk about opponents and again you know maybe if, if we're at something really high level like the kids trying to make a 1700 world team or a 2900 world team or win a junior national title you know it's like 16 through 18 year olds i might take a peek at the guy but again i still i still don't want my athlete over concerned about what the other person does i want them more we're going to implement their style. And maybe there's one or two things we have to worry about. There's one or two things we have to worry about. But at the young, at the younger ages, I'm never, I don't even, it doesn't even concern me. I, I don't even want to think about it. I just want to think about, you know, again, I'm not trying to get an 11 year old to win a specific match. I'm trying to get an 11 year old to be a good wrestler. So worrying about specific matches is going to take away from the long-term progress rather than add to it. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's really, uh, it's really interesting that you put it that way. I mean, I just remember, my, I guess, more skill-oriented sport when I was playing was basketball, and the coach would always talk about the. And I think that's important to talk about the other team, but I, I never really thought of it in the sense of like continually studying elites. And I think the social media and we're not social media, just just digital age, it, those videos always being at an access are are huge and being able to do that yeah. more easily now. I mean, we'd had to get like VHS tapes and just <laughs> great, you know, mm-hmm. you had to dig hard twenty years ago to find these things at your academy, though. I'm I'm curious. So in terms of skill teaching, like like raw fundamental skills versus improvisation and and letting more like flow happen, I guess what's the balance there between those two entities? And in, in terms of like letting people flow and be creative, and then kind of saying, hey, you should do this skill X Y Z uh, in these like manners. Yeah, I would say the, the younger they are, the more structure we have, and then as they get older, we you know we kind of I don't want to say let them totally go on their own, and I might say, hey, like. You know, that's probably not a good idea, but we do let them start having an idea of what they want to do. And the, I think you pointed out that the the digital age and our ability to watch other people um, is so huge. I remember, you know, when I was in college, I was going around, I was teaching camps all over the country. You know, if I named even a top five college guy, like popularity wise, they probably would not have an idea who that was. Or maybe like three guys in the audience, right? There's 40 kids, three guys. Say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. And now, now it's something. Now I can cite a specific match. I can say who watched this match versus this match, and you know, half the hands go up or three quarters of the hands go up. It's just like wrestling is now being able to be consumed, and that, and honestly, the sport is, it's progressing at a very rapid rate because of that. And kids are getting better much earlier because of that. And I, I think it's tremendous to have, like you said, because wrestling is so skillful to have kids at a young age being able to watch those really high level performers. Where that you know that did happen when I was a kid, or you know, or any time before me, that's happening. I think that's hugely influential, and it's really awesome. Would you say that uh, your academies, the way that you teach children, uh, do you uh, is that different than other academies in the way yeah. that you know? Oh, yeah. How how does tell me a little bit about that based off your own exploration? Yeah, we're, we're way different in a number of ways, but specifically from the, the teaching standpoint, you know, I would say. The younger ones, we do we teach, right? This this how you do it, this how you do it, this how you do it. But once we get to that older, you know, the high school age range, a lot of them, it's like, listen, here's what I do. I've had a lot of success. And here's what I would advise. Here's a couple other options. Go try it for yourself, right? Everything's not going to work the same for every single person. Everybody's body moves a little different. Everybody's a little stronger in different positions. So fi- figure out what works for you. Whereas, you know, a lot of wrestling coaches are like, do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do anything else. No, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. Do this. And, you know, for us, it, we, we feel as though once you get to the higher level, not, not on the beginner stage, once you get to the higher level, you're going to have to figure out a specific style for you. Now, uh, do some things go across the board for everyone? Yeah, that's true, right? Some things just kind of cross the board. You need to be able to have good position, right? That's, yeah, that's going to be true for almost everybody. You're going to need to be able to attack the legs. That's true for almost everybody. But then within those, you're going to have some um, improvisation out of different people. I love what you said about improvisation. And so I think that's, I've had multiple talks with different sports performance coaches. And a lot of them, Mm -hmm. they're in the private sector, sports performance, and then they're working with kids who are, you know, in various specialty sport coaching structures. And one of the regular complaints is just how robotic and drill oriented those sport practices are, where the kids are just doing everything. Here's the model. Here's the technique. And like you said, in wrestling, there's some things that you need to be able to do. But mm-hmm. I like how you're encouraging creativity and problem solving in your your athletes rather than I mean, is there where is that line like where it's like, OK, here's 
here's generally a thing you need to do, a skill, and it should be like this versus yeah. um, opening up and saying, here, find some different ways to solve this and find some different ways to do this. Well, I feel like that always comes through through competition, right? So you see a kid and they get to a certain level and then say it's right they're Say they're really having great success at the state level. Maybe they win state titles or they're coming really close. But then when they get to the national level, they're always coming up short. And it's like, I can, I can think of several kids that would fit this category. And it's like, yeah, but why do you keep coming up short? And it's like, and usually from a technical perspective or, or a psychological perspective, it, it's relatively easy to figure out. And now that's not saying they're never going to have another, you know, get to solve problems. Not that they're never going to have another problem. But if you say, hey, man, you're, you're never getting up bottom. Like you're getting ridden all the time. That's why you can't win. You need to spend away. At the state level, sure, you can get away. But at the national level, that's just not happening for you. We need to solve this problem, right? Or, you know, from a, a psychological standpoint, it's like, well, you only do good when you have leads, right? I mean, it's kids who only do good when things are going their way. And it's like, well, we need to develop something. And at, at the state level, they're so good that things mm-hmm. almost always go their way. They never have to deal with that adversity. But inevitably, you're going to find, you know, when you wrestle at a higher level, or compete at a higher level in any sport, you're going to find adversity. So when when you do find that adversity, how do you you know, how do you succeed from there? Right? How do you say, okay, I'm losing five to two. Here's what I need to do. Where some people just shut down. So you know, I think it's one of those things where just you go through competitions and you you try to solve the problems and help the kids solve the problems for themselves. It makes me wonder as you talk about this. I mean, my experience, you said you had played football, I think, or baseball, like back before wrestling and with yep. the team sports. And I myself had played basketball before track and field. Track and field, there's not as much creativity. There is still some, but it's not like. I mean, well, very flop, baby. Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, I, as, <laughs> but that's like once in a, you know, once in a 40 years thing. But then again, yeah. I mean, there's still like little nuances and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was thinking as, as you're, as you're speaking, I think there's almost a different form of, I mean, you know, this being something that I'd like to hear your take on, but the sure. creativity in, in combat versus a, a ball sport. I mean, there's tons of creativity in any form of team sport, but I feel like that, that a, a combat of sport wrestling, something that's physical probably has a lot of offering to athletes who might be doing other sports that go beyond. I, I'm sure there's a lot of probably crossover. Could you speak a little bit on yeah. what you think like a wrestling or, or grappling and combative has for uh, someone who might just yeah. play football or something later on well i so i i think you uh i don't know that it has to do with the individual and listen i'm not i'm not super educated on team sports as i haven't played them in a very long time so i mean i don't want to speak for those team sports but you know i'll just say like for example for you know you said track and field pick out a hundred meter dash right there's only so many ways to run a hundred meter dash and maybe there's some small technical improvements but it's it's right there's only so many ways to do it Whereas wrestling, there's an exponential amount of ways to find success. MMA would be even different, right? Because you could choose. Now, you could do the wrestling with an MMA. You could also do jiu-jitsu. You could also strike, right? You could put those things together and you need combinations. So it just, you know, some of these things. And I think, you know, I would think something like football, there would be kind of a high level of creativity. And now it's more like maybe not individual by individual, but as like a team organism, Right. There's there's creativity by the coaching staff and the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, the, the more, you know, in MMA, there's so many ways to have success. And the more ways you can you can be able to be successful yourself, the, the greater likelihood you have of winning. Because, you know, if you have game plan A and you go in there, it doesn't work. Well, some people just have game plan A and they say, oh, shit, game plan A didn't work. I'm, I guess I'm going to lose now. Some people got game plan B. Right. So game plan is where they go to game plan B. Oh, crap. That doesn't work. Some people go to game plan C. Right. And some people can just keep trying to win. I, I actually did. a I do this thing called Mental Monday on one of my Facebook pages. And I did one on one of the greatest wrestlers in America, Jordan Burroughs. You know, he was in a situation where technically he wasn't getting done. And athletic, athletically, he wasn't getting it done. He was losing the match. But, you know, great champions just find ways. And he, he just essentially uh, wrestled at such a hard pace. He exhausted the other person. And he won that way, right? Great champions have multiple game plans and multiple ways to win. I wanted to take a break from the show and briefly share with you the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years ago, I had Logan Christopher, CEO of Lost Empire Herbs, on the show to talk about hypnosis and mental training for athletes. While talking to him, I realized he also had an herbalism company. 
So shortly thereafter, I used the Phoenix formula, which was my first product I bought from them. I had great results with it, not only increasing my energy and decreasing my need for coffee and caffeine, but I also noticed that it was making an impact on my lifts and my weight room numbers. I was having a great training experience. Shortly thereafter, I also got into the Shiliagit resin as well as other herbs. And I don't look at supplementation the same way. I'm a strong believer in what Logan and his company are doing in looking for a natural resource to boost human performance. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally from Lost Empire Herbs, you can head to www.lostempireherbs.com slash just fly. There you can get 15% off your order and they offer a 365 day money back guarantee. Definitely check them out. Let's get on back to the show. Yeah, and I would say like you're you're right. Even with the with 100 meter dash, there's not there's not that many ways to run it. I mean, it, it yeah. gets pretty close to a technical model. But I, I do like the idea of that it's good to have options. Like even just with 100, there's still joints that need to move. There's still options and strategies even on that micro level. And then you just take that to macro and wrestling. It's even or even if you look at basketball, football, anything, oh, yeah. it's just there's going to be the more options and weapons you have, the better. And when I was playing basketball in high school, I mean, I, I look back, I had so few options. Like it's just I relied so heavily. It's like almost the opposite in a sense like i relied so heavily on being i was just a better athlete just being faster yeah. and and whatnot like i i leveled my other options like i i was i was became worse at basketball and it's no wonder i ended up doing track because it's just that's <laughs> that was the natural outcome okay if you're going to try to have your main option be this it's just not going to work out for you so take me through like a typical practice for your your young wrestlers what does that look like and what what um are some nuances that you think are really define your style that you've come up with or and your lessons that you've learned from teaching them yeah yeah so i i guess i would just say like I said, with, with the younger guys a little different right it, it is more regimented not as not as strict there's some other things we do different but from a technical standpoint i wouldn't say it's that much different it's really where where we get those high school wrestlers mm-hmm. where we start changing it up a little bit and it's a lot of it is a little a lot of putting them in position and giving them their options right and then you, you let them go at it and then you bring it in and you say okay you know what were the issues we're having let's solve that issue well you know and so we you know, bring it in and a whole bunch of guys say, well i struggle with this well i'm having a problem with that and then it's like okay so then i answer right i said well here's some other things you might be able to try from there and this that, that kind of group learning uh, because you can guess if, if one person's having the issue, there's probably other other people having a similar type issue. Yeah, so I, I think I think that's a big one. Is just we kind of have that group learning, group thinking, and again, a lot of wrestling programs, and this is at a collegiate level, high school level, youth level. They think the only solution to their problems is doing things more and doing things harder. Yes, and the I I, I completely agree with you because that's there's that's all be some sports. Track people like that, right? Oh, well, yeah, without, without a doubt. I mean, it's it's the same thing. It's like, especially like in weightlifting, for example, it's like, okay, well, if your your half squat went up by X amount and you got a little better, it's like, well, if I just keep increasing it, am I I'm not just going to yeah. be fat? And it just doesn't work that way. And so, Have you read, um, is this, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, man, where is it? I'm blanking on the guy's name, but the guy, he was on Rogan. He has a book and he swears that, there was a handful of guys who did just the kettlebell swing and they maintained the same amount of power that they did, you know, and we're talking Olympic level lifters. Sure. Did you remember that? Do you know this guy's I, name? It may have been Pavel Satsling because I know. Pavel. Yeah, yes, probably. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. What do you think about his stuff? I, so listen, here's the deal. When I listen to these strength and conditioning experts, sometimes I think they have good ideas, right? But like, if you listen to a wrestling guy, you might think he has a good idea, but me being more educated in the subject matter, I said, ah, he's kind of an idiot, right? So, like, sometimes I listen to these strength and conditioning guys, and I think, well, wow, this guy's really smart, but maybe he's really a dummy, and I just don't know because I don't know the subject matter well enough. Sure. Well, that's, uh, yeah, so the, the kettlebell swing maintaining, because he's talked about that for even powerlifters using that. And I think yeah. I wouldn't say that that's, like, their main line, but if you've gained X amount of strength, and let's just say for two, three months, I don't know how long the time period is, but you can almost do... And I, I respect the heck out of Pavel. He has a book called Easy Strength. He co-wrote with Dan John. That's like one of my top, like top, top books. Like in, it's brilliant. Uh, so I would say, but there's a period that you can pretty much do anything for maybe two, three months. That's kind of in the ballpark, like close and it's high velocity. Uh, like I've heard of in track, it's not uncommon to not do as much Olympic lifting in the competitive season. And you're just racing people, sprinting real fast and your yeah. clean goes up. So as long as really? you're move, yeah, as long as you're moving with high velocity and high power, and you have a lot of intention, 
Uh, and it's also Pavel talks about a same but different. So it's like maybe this this energy system, you're working a little higher in the energy system bracket. It's a little more fatiguing. It's just different. Sometimes that yeah. novelty is good, too. I mean, I could believe that, but I don't think they could do it for that long. You know, like so why, why is velocity that important? Just curious, out of my own curiosity. Yeah, velocity. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say it's the highest uh, form of coordination. Like the faster you move, the brain has to work faster to coordinate mm-hmm. everything so you don't hurt yourself. Um, there's going to be, you could also make the argument of motor unit, like the faster you move, you're going to get the most fast switch motor units. Whereas if you aren't moving as fast, the brain can have the options to select the slower. Like it's like, okay, it's safer just to stay with these slower, lower threshold units, but the faster you go, the brain has no choice. Like it has to forcibly start recruiting these higher threshold and it all has to do it fast enough to keep you safe, like not hurting yourself. So it's just a very high coordinative demand. It's, it's very it just a general, like a very binary, you say it's just very stimulating. Like there's just Got a, it. it's just a higher stimulation. So there's a lot of, I think, theories you could say, but the, hopefully I explained it as well as I could yeah. there. Okay. I got one more question then. So I'm going to ask quite a few questions. Um, so with Pavel, the other thing that is really counterintuitive to most wrestlers, and even I think I think more than most wrestlers, but I like really struggle with this concept. Is that it's like the suboptimal effort? Like you don't need to give full effort on everything, and you really actually he, he would he argued that you need to pull back effort in order to maintain most strength. And it's like wrestlers, you know, and, may, and this again, I'm not in other sports. This could be the same in other sports, but we just want to go till it burns yeah. all the time. Like we want our lungs to hurt, we want our muscles to burn, and you know, the thought that we could do less work and get better results is like that's really really hard to get through my brain. So what do you think about that thought? No, that's so that book that he wrote uh, with he wrote it with a guy named Dan John who's also been on this mm-hmm. podcast. It's called Easy Strength. So that's like the mo. And so from a pure strength or pure speed or pure power perspective, I I live by that stuff. Really? Oh yeah, without without question. And the reason why the easiest way I could put it is just maybe just from a threat level on the brain. If I'm sprinting, for example, and okay. it's probably a little bit different with lifting, but let's just say sprinting, high chance of, of injury if it's uh, me in the jungle trying to survive and I'm running as fast as I can, there's a lot of like really quick, just bam, 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 muscle firing going on. Yeah. And if it goes wrong, just one, I could pull my hamstring and then a tiger is going to eat me. So this yeah. is a high... Oh, we got tigers here now. Yeah, or, or whatever, I mean, or whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, but... It's a high, it's a high threat situation, and so in those high threat situations where there's possibility to in, possibility of injury, the closer I push into those into that threat region, the more the brain is likely to suppress my like hormonal adrenal output because it doesn't want me doing that all the time. Like if I'm just sprinting, really? if I'm sprinting pedal to the metal on the track all the time, my chance of injury is going up. Therefore, my brain survival instincts are saying, "Look, if you keep doing this." I'm going to have a hard time coordinating this all to make sure you stay safe. So therefore, I will downregulate you for the next X amount of days just to make sure that I can coordinate everything and you will not pull a hamstring or hurt yourself. You could say the same thing with squat, squatting heavy, although that's a little bit safer, but you could also say, you know, back issues, injuries, axial loading. Yeah. You could say that it also doesn't want to do that. I think with lifting, there's also the mental component, the component of failure. So there's a, I'm trying to remember her name. It's a Stanford psychologist, but there's an emotion that comes up with each movement, like running, just going up for jog. You feel the emotion of freedom. If you lift, you feel the emotion of confidence. And that's why a lot of, for many reasons, a lot of people love lifting, but really when you prove it, yeah, prove it. Oh, what is her name? Kelly. Oh. I'm, I'm killing, I'm kicking myself that I can't remember it right now. Okay. Um, McGonagall, I think was, is her name. Yeah, I'll okay. put to put that in the show notes, but I, this is just my theory, but I feel like with lifting, as soon as you get to the fail point, and easy strength is every rep, you do it and you aren't really losing speed, there's no grind, I shelf it, I'm done. Not only do I not go into, I guess you could call it threat level, where the brain is afraid of getting hurt, but you yeah. also have confidence because as soon as the bar slows down, it's like, oh, I, I, you, you come toe-to-toe with your limit, your psychological yeah, uh-huh. limit. And that actually, I think, could... Because it's almost like you could say, I don't know, law of attraction, mental, whatever, yeah. but like you are you are now confronted with your limitation. And I yeah. just think that between the threat and then that constant like, oh, I, I ace that set, I ace that set, I ace that set, you you have a better mental uh, momentum. Huh. So day to day to day. So I think between yeah. those two things, 
at least from the speed and strength and power perspective, that's where you can just build, build, build. And then the final thing is they say that like going above 90%. So if I go, if I'm under 90% or 80 or whatever, but as soon as I go above 90, it's not so much about building strength as expressing what I have. So as soon as I hit that grinder of a set, I'm more expressing what I already have, but I'm not really building it. So those are the main things. Yeah, I'm I'm submaximal for life pretty much, except for maybe like, you know, high output, like cleans are a little more leeway, but like the grinds, like the squats and the deadlifts and benches, you get up there and and you're you're playing with fire more the higher you go, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's something. And now, so it's funny because when I got my hip surgery, all my, all my back pain went away. And I always just thought my back was bad from wrestling and working hard for, you know, 20 years or whatever. And it was, it was all related to a hip, which I, I did not, I did not, I discounted that. I didn't think it was a possibility. But one of the things I, and now if I, maybe I'll start training, and I'm not sure, but I think I would take away a lot of heavy lifting. If I mm-hmm. go back and do, you know, can I do some over? I just do it. It's just not necessary for, to be done. I don't feel like for me to be an elite athlete. It's something like you said, when, especially when you're young, when you're in college, you, I, I loved it. And then as I got older, I did, I did less of it, but I still did it. I would probably even have done less than I did. Yeah, I think that's I, – I know with the, the MMA world, that's like a big debate too. Should we lift? Should we not lift? I, I had the opportunity, good fortune, to train with Gary Marinovich, Marvin Marinovich's brother. Who, oh, yeah. That's mm-hmm. where I think Nick Kirsten got a lot of influence, and, and Gary had a funny – some NFL – running back or something was going to train with him and gary's like oh how much do you squat and the guy's like oh 500 and gary's like well i feel sorry for you <laughs> like i feel that i guess you do you've built this up so much you must be rigid or anyways yeah that's uh i think that's that i mean i've never worked with that population but i just think that's yeah. an interesting you know discussion once you're once you're established in there and that so Absolutely. anyways i want to get back to uh, what we were talking about which was um so the wrestling practice and i thought it was really cool how you bring everyone together to chat as a group because I think mm-hmm. about well when I was in basketball like in high school like we would never like it would never be like you know let's say this play didn't work out and I don't remember where the coach would ever bring us together and where we actually talk about solutions really? to this oh never never in basketball ever. it seems like it'd be even more important because you have to function <laughs> as a unit and uh, listen I don't play basketball so I could totally be wrong but it seems like the more you understood where everyone was at on the court at the same time, yes. and the functions, the better you would be able to play as a unit. Oh, hundred percent, without question. As soon as you mentioned that with wrestling, and again, and granted, I guess that there's the more the individual level, but there's just the power of people coming together. And it, well, yeah, like you said, basketball, you're all working together at the same time, or football, and so I just, yeah, my, I mean, I've had, I've fully appreciated my coaches, but. That's where a thing, though, as I see as a coach, like as soon as we start seeing ourselves as a facilitator and not this like iron fisted, like instructor of these techniques and strategies, I just think the, you know, even if a coach just said, hey, let's just come together for five minutes once a day and talk about this play, that would be probably five minutes more than happens in most sports as I've, at least as I've been through it myself. Yeah. Well, because you also know, even if they're not, you're right, it's a group of 35 guys or whatever. If one of them is is having, you know, is asking the question, there's got to be a couple other in the group that are having a similar problem. But then who knows when someone else in that group will have the problem in the future, right? And then they go back to, oh, wait about this, right? We talked about two weeks ago, and, and that was the answer. So now I know the answer because I heard it two weeks ago. I think it, it would be great, too, because it gives you the perspective. If it's in a team setting, it gives me the perspective. Like, I'm the small forward. Well, now I know what the point guard's thinking when we're talking about yeah, this stuff. Now I know absolutely. what the center's thinking rather than just the coach telling us what we should be thinking. <laughs> it just it makes a lot of sense for just to break it, that down. And I, and I know one thing that um, probably is not now the case for me, but definitely was the case for, for me at, at uh, some point in time when we started the academy is like, when I came back, right? So I I, went, I left high school, I wrestled in college, competed at a very high level. I coached at the collegiate level in Mizzou. I coached at the collegiate level at Arizona State. I came back, and then, you know, say a couple of years later when we're having these discussions, it's like, I, I forgot what it's like to be at that level. <laughs> I haven't been at that level in, in a decade plus. Like, I can't relate to that. So I don't, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're struggling with because I haven't been at that level, and I haven't been working with guys that are at that level. So to be able to take a step back and now, right now it's easy. Cause it's like, 
okay, I know that these kids are having this problem at this point. When they're in seventh grade, right, a lot of kids are having this issue with this position. And I, I can kind of guess now where people are going to have issues. But if you look at, you know, me in 2013, where I was, you know, just coaching at the collegiate level prior to that for a decade or, or competing myself, I wasn't used to those questions and problems. So, you know, it also gives you that perspective of what are these kids thinking and what are they going through? And, and by now I can, I, I have a good idea and I can kind of guess, but if we go, you know, many years ago, I definitely wasn't. So that it was helpful for me in that matter also. Do you feel like you mentioned this at the beginning of the show, like you didn't have, well, we graduated high school at the same time, but we didn't yeah. really have access to video at all. Like, like if I wanted to watch a high jump video, it's like pop out the VCR, like you have to order it online somewhere. Like it's just totally different versus now you have all these different styles of movement, whatever your sport at your fingertips. So do you feel like, how do you feel like the sport of wrestling has, has changed both from just an evolution over oh, time and then the way lot. the kids are processing it now? Oh, so the kids are so much better, so much earlier, for sure, without a doubt. And the sport is progressing at a much more rapid, rapid level, right? Because I said when I was in high school, you couldn't watch anything. Couldn't watch, you, couldn't, you, had a, you couldn't find it on tape, right? And now, you know, we're being, it really, it really just been in, in the last, say, two to four years where we've been able to watch international level stuff. So international level mm. will be the highest level of competition. That's the world championship, the Olympics. Um, that's finally becoming more and more available to us where it was not earlier. So yeah, man, wrestling is progressing at a very, very rapid rate, much more rapid than any time before. And then kids are getting better much earlier because the, because of the availability of that stuff. Yeah. Do you think that ever works negatively in the sense that like Instagram, there's just so much out there, right? I mean, I mean, I guess yeah. at worst you just observe people, but how do you, do you feel like it's a double-edged sword at all with people's skill acquisition? Um, no, I, I, I don't, think so at all you know i i think from a psychological standpoint the one thing in wrestling that it, it, it still plagues it but it, it's getting a little bit better but i think i think it's gonna get a lot better and i'm kind of leading this charge in wrestling is that you don't have to be great early to be great late i don't have mm -hmm. to win the nationals at 88 years old to have success later right I, I had my first success at the national level after my 11th grade year right now when i was eight years old when after my 11th grade year so i was you know, one year from graduate high school, I had my first success success ever on the national level. And now, you know, I could, we've replicated that with many kids at our academies. And so this notion that you have to have success early to have success late is, is not correct. And, but a lot of people in wrestling still think this. And so they force kids to do things at a really young age. It's actually the reason I hope no one gets mad. At me. I, I hate gymnastics. My daughter actually, she does one day a week gymnastics. But there's other kids are age to do five, and she wants to do more. And my problem with gymnastics is if you want to achieve the highest levels, you do have to start mm -hmm. doing it at that age. And age seven and eight is not the time that kids are making those decisions on their own where, you know, I want to be great at this. And that's like in wrestling, I see it like probably ages 12, 13, 14, where they make their, where it clicks in their head and they say, man, this is something I want to work hard at and I want to be really good at, right? But it doesn't happen when they're seven or eight. But in gymnastics, if you want to be good at seven or eight, so it's being forced on them by the parents and by the coaches. And so in wrestling, when that's forced on them at age seven or eight, a few of them end up being successful, but a lot of them end up burning out because they're just not, at that age, they're not able to handle the workload and the emotional workload that's put on them. I've thought about actually that, yeah, with gymnastics a lot recently because I've been talking to parents who's – kids are in gymnastics and it's like you know the kids 10 and they're practicing for hours and i'm like this is crazy is a week in it's no crazy. other sport would this be the case it's just the fact that if you want to go to the olympics or something this yes. is what you need to do and so it's kind of crazy because it is a dichotomy of well don't you want to be the best at something if you're going to do it right that's but why the, i don't want her to do it because yeah. <laughs> I, I understand i already understand definitively what it's going to take to be the best and i'm not willing to push her through that you know, when she's she's seven years old, I'm not I'm not willing to do that. I don't, yeah. think it's, I don't think it's worth the sacrifice. Yeah, I don't I don't either. I just think that's a, it's just a, that's a very unique situation where it's like okay, like I I don't know if you want to be the best, it's just a really unique set of challenges and it's a tough yeah. tough deal. It's pretty much the only sport that you could say that about. Even men's gymnastics is not that way. Mm -hmm. Track and field, wrestling, right? Most sports you're not reaching the pinnacle of your success till probably your mid twenties, and so if you start in your mid-teens you're you're going to be fine it's no problem at all but gymnastics 
specifically female gymnastics is one of those where if you're going to reach the pinnacle, you're probably going to do it in your middle teenage years. Yeah. 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 Very unique situation. Is there any other sports like that? I mean, I I would even say like a powerlifting or something would probably be even later in your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah, all those other things peak. Like it's only it's a unique thing where it's just body size, strength to body weight. Like you know, you, and then there's the wear and tear of the actual sport. There's probably a lot that of unique too, yeah. thing. By the time you know, if you start when you're six, by the time you're twenty, your body's going to be in some rough shape from that. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask you. I found this really interesting because I just think this is like this is. I want to still. I want to use the back a little bit to get into mentality and mindset mm-hmm. and all that. But yeah. I do want to ask you. Because I think this is probably a tough thing in dealing with parents, right? Like the parents, like, oh, I want my kid to be so good right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, and oh, absolutely. How do you deal with that? And how do you educate parents to, to really buy into that long term vision? What are some yeah. some elements it's, of that? It's been, man, it's been tough. It's been tough because, and my, my brother talks about this all the time, but most parents only pay attention maybe like a year above and a year below their kid, right? Mm-hmm. And most parents, it's their first time through this process. So they're not looking at it as, okay, I've been watching the way this program has developed kids. They don't watch them from age eight to age 18 and see and see what happens, right? They only watch them in that one or two years around their kid. So they're not seeing the whole process. They're not knowing how it works. And so if a kid is winning a state title at age eight or nine, they can sometimes be fooled by that because there's a lot of things I can do to make a kid win a state title at age eight or nine that are going to be bad for his long-term success, right? I can, I can make them cut weight. I can make them grind really hard. And listen, they're going to be great at age eight, nine. And then at age 11, they're just not going to want to do it. They're going to want to do something else, right? And so it might have been good for that really short window of time, but for the, you know, the long longevity of that kid, it's not going to be good. And so in the early time, because we, we turned the philosophy of youth wrestling on its head, we got a lot of pushback. And now that we're nine years in this game and you can name, well, this kid ne- never, not, not at age eight, never won a U state title. And they earned a division one scholarship. This kid, same thing, same thing, same thing. Right. So now mm-hmm. we have all these kids. Yeah. We have a whole bunch of kids who never even want to use the hill. Not that they didn't win it when they're eight or nine years old. No, they didn't. So for wrestling, U state goes up to age 15. They just didn't win it ever. They were never good enough. Okay. And yet they earned a division one scholarship. Yet they won a national title at, at, eight, at 18 unders, right? Or whatever it is. And so we have all of these examples to point to. And we say, well, this kid did it. And this kid did it. And this kid did it. And this kid did it. So obviously the system is working. It works. Just trust the system. It doesn't have to be done this other way. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think other sports, like I've heard that with like with baseball, the the kids who are the best at 12 are oftentimes not the best at 18. And so it's... I think it'd be important for the yeah, other sports too. I think there's a lot to learn from that. And just, yeah, generating the case studies and things like that yeah. is, is really um, helpful. And so the other thing, I, I think we've been lucky. Actually, I, I worked with this guy. At, uh, it's called Reform Sports Parent. I don't know if you've heard of them. No, it sounds um, awesome though. It's, it's a great website and they have a really good Facebook page and Twitter. But the same thing is most youth coaches are not incentivized to do what's right for the long term for kids. And I talk about this a lot, right? If I told half my parents that they need to do two private lessons with me a week and they need to pay me X amount for those private lessons. They, and I told them that's what they need to do to be successful. Most likely they would do it and that would help, help my business from, from a dollars and cents standpoint. If I told them they need to practice an extra couple of days a week and they need to pay me X amount to do so and to be successful, they would probably do that. I could convince a high, high amount for them to do so. And so for most youth coaches, the incentive for a long-term success of a kid and the incentive for what their bank account says are two different things. Yes, 100%. And, and that that creates a really tough situation because most youth coaches are going to probably side with whatever their bank account says is best. Yeah, no, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I've I've had discussions with this um like a buddy of mine Paul Cater. I for he's like you talk about the only way how what's the purest way that we could like get this system to be better for yeah. long-term development. And I think I do think like Simon Sinek conscious capitalism like what you're doing, you know, if everyone was just like this would be awesome, but you also look at like <laughs> the Soviet system. Uh, granted the Soviet system they'll you know, burn people up like but it's like state, you know, state sponsor yeah. this is how we mm-hmm. do it. This is the long-term plan that yeah. it, uh, I just think there's a lot of interesting well, yeah, and then it, it, it's hard because it goes against the monetary interest of a lot of people. Yes. If you're going to do that, because I mean, well, I was talking about youth clubs, but then think about like youth national tournaments. Well, 
youth natural tournaments are probably counterintuitive to the long-term progress of a lot of kids. Be, and, and But their whole purpose is, hey, look how important this tournament is. Your kid's going to get this trophy and they're going to be recognized if they win. And that is their whole business model. So they're incentivized to make you feel as though it's really important that you come to their event and that your kid has success and your kid does this. When I, I would argue that it's really not all that important, but then, so I don't, I make zero dollars from arguing against that. Whereas their whole business model is to make kids feel that way. So they are incentivized to spend a whole bunch of money, time and effort to get kids to come to the tournaments where a guy like me, I earn zero dollars for <laughs> saying, don't go there. Right. It's not worth <laughs> the time. Yeah. It's a waste of money effort, and, you know? And so like, there's not the monetary incentives for people to properly push back against that system. Yeah, it really is almost like a nonprofit drive in favor of children. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's crazy. Oh man, we could do a whole show on that. I got. I mean, that's that is a topic I'm passionate about. Um, but absolutely. I do want to get to the the mental element of things, and so I want to bring it back to something that you said way in the beginning that I thought was really interesting. Uh, and that was that you didn't. You said you didn't really study your opponents so much as you studied the greats. And yeah. I think that's really interesting because could you elaborate a little bit more on that and, and your just general mentality on like you have a big match coming up or, or how you crafted your technique versus who you were facing? Oh, man, <laughs> that, that's a question that could last a whole show. Yeah, I would say so. I would say not worrying about my opponent, who my opponent was is a big thing. And, you know, we, if we talk about that, I do the mental money is that the, num- the number one issue that people have is. You know, little Billy is really good, but then he gets to the big match and he has a letdown, right? That's that's the number one question. Asked. How do how do I get this to happen? Um, and that question can be asked in a whole bunch of formats, but the idea is generally the same: is that for some reason you found found a reason to make this match different, right? Maybe it's the state championships and you build them for this. Maybe it's a specific kid. Maybe it's because a college coach is watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for some reason, you made this match different. And you jacked up your anxiety level because of that. And because you had such a high anxiety level, you performed really poorly. So it's like, how do you make, how do you make every single, how do you make every single match the exact same where you're just going out there to handle business? It's like, okay, I shake hands and I'm just doing the same thing. I'm wrestling because the more you can keep those things similar, generally the better off you're going to perform. And I, I always talk about for kids and some kids don't realize this, but it's like a wave, right? And so on the top of the wave is the best performance you have. On the bottom of the wave is the worst performance you have. And generally, if you ask kids in that format, can you can you think about the best match you had last year? Can you think about the worst match you had last year? And generally, they say yes. So then how do you talk it? When you perform your best, how would you warm up? What were you thinking? Et cetera, et cetera. When you're at your worst, same question. Okay? How do I eliminate the bottom of that wave, right? How do I? And then ideally, essentially, how do I perform on this top, the top of that wave at all times? Right. Um, so essentially, then your median would be moved up and then you'd be having really small waves around your best performance. But that, I think that concept is really important. Yeah. How much of you guys' practice time do you really dedicate to sitting down and just doing like some mental exercise, thinking about the mental or is this yeah. like outside of practice or how does that yeah. shake out in your practices? Um, not a ton within practice. I do. I do a mental Monday, you know, all the time. Uh, but I, I would circle back to it's more based around competition. Right. So when you see those things in competition, you say, hey, you know, Billy, this happened for this reason. And then you can bring that back up in practice, right? Um, because the kid's not giving up effort in practice, he, he's not able to give that effort in competition. So then when you see him doing it in practice, you say, hey, remember that one competition, you didn't win because you weren't able to generate the right amount of effort, right? Or it could be, it could be any mental issue that they're having, but you bring it back up in practice, what happened in the match, because generally kids are most open to changing their mind or their perspective on something um, when it happened to them at a time that was really meaningful. If you just mm-hmm. pick and practice stuff, they kind of, a lot of kids have the ability to explain it away. Ah, it's just practice, it's just practice right? But when it happens at a really meaningful match and you can point out the flaw, you can then bring it back to competition um, and say, hey, this happened in competition because, or because of this. Now let's fix it in practice first. Sure. So you're really your your mental um, focus really just highlighting the competition as that like emotional incubator and really trying to draw out the yes. things there versus maybe a day to day practice mental checklist whatever yeah. you know like it's just let's focus on the competition and the ups and downs and and what use that as our teacher more so than a let's 
do all this mental stuff for practice type mentality. Um, yeah, or I shouldn't it, say that. I feel like it, that's not a good way of me explaining no, it. But, no, no, yeah. no. I, I think it is. I think it's hard because I think it's hard to replicate the feelings and the emotions around competitions and practice. Yes, it's I really agree. hard to re- replicate those. And so if you can then pick those in competitions and then bring them back to the practice, I think that's where you can be really effective. Awesome. Awesome. I, I like that. Cause that, that was like me in basketball. Like I, yeah. I don't know, practice was, there was just not the things I cared about as a high schooler, much of which attempt, <laughs> it, as soon as you put the crowds in there and just the way the competition is, that's when everything was just all sorts of different ways, especially for me, I was crazy up and down. And now at 37, I can go back and I, I have a little bit better understanding, but Hey, obviously can't rewind time. Uh, one of the things <laughs> that I really, you know, I, in, in preparing for this podcast, I mean, like I told you, I'm, I'm one of the strength coaches who probably watches sports the least, and my head's always buried in a book, but I, I, I have watched some of your matches, and one of the things I just love about watching you is it, it reminds me of the snowboarder Sean White, who won all these X mm. Games, He and he said his mentality was like a laser-like focus while slightly not caring, because if yeah, you care too much... Perfect. And so I watch it's like you're almost like you're trying just different things and having fun. And the other guy's like stone cold serious. Uh, I mean, could you go into that, like your mentality and matches and how that kind of opened up uh, things for you? Or? Yeah. Well, I, I think I think it circles back to kind of what I said before is, you know, a- anxiety is negatively correlated with the performance. And so if I have that high anxiety, uh, I'm going to I'm going to not have my optimal performance. And so for me, it's about staying loose and staying relaxed. And then the other thing is just uh, I think. A lot of people, if they could learn to do this, they would enjoy it a lot more. But I always, I love competition because for me, it's this outlet to show the world what I'm working on and how hard I've been working. Mm. And I think a lot of people, they view it the exact opposite way where it's almost, it can take away from who they are. If I lose, people are going to think less of me, right? And for me, it was always just like, I, I get this, it's like a camp, a blank canvas and I get to go show you guys what I've been working on and show you guys how hard I've been working and show you guys how good I've gotten. And so I like, I loved it. I always really looked forward to competition. And if they, you know, I don't compete anymore because I'm retired. If if I could not train, right? <laughs> if I could just go compete and have that, you're right. And obviously, but if you if you compete without training, it's not optimal competition, right? Uh, but that that just that walking out to the matter, walking out to the cage, that aspect of it, man, I miss that a lot because I just I always just look forward to it so much. I think that. That's something that I could resonate with because I think I I loved practicing, but I was the opposite. Like I had a hard time loving competition. And and so do you feel like, did you have to, was that something you always had a little bit or did you have to really work and and hone that or refine that? Or or how do you teach people that? Like what are some, what are some elements there? So I go back to one, I go back to one time and it's hard because I don't really remember prior to this. I don't, it's hard. Right. So this happened when I was 14. And so it's hard for me to remember prior to it if this was a big turning point or if it was just a little focus. But I struggled with this one national tournament, and my one, my coach pinpointed that it was because I was doing what I said not to earlier, right? I was building it up. I had a lot of anxiety. It was a big tournament. It was if I win, I'm, there's going to be a lot of positive things that come from it. And I was worrying about the, all the negatives, right? I had a lot of anxiety. And he just talked to me about how, um, how that was bad for my performance. And he talked to me about a few different ways that I could – help myself stay away from that, help myself avoid that trap. And I I was really able to kind of fully embrace that after that. So I don't really remember that, you know, I remember that one tournament, which is really negative. Prior to that, I have a hard time remembering anything, whether it was positive or negative in, 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 you know, the relation to the way I thought about competition. But after that, you know, I remember just, you know, having a lot of love for competition, things, feeling really positive about it. And and I think a lot of it may be attributed to the fact that I was able to implement those tactics that he was talking about to limit anxiety. Yeah, what were what were some of those? And do those are those some things you uh, teach your young athletes? Or yeah, how does that absolutely. go Absolutely. And um everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. And so for me, you know, one of my strengths that that also can become a weakness is I'm I'm super obsessive. And so certain times that's, that's great. Right. And we talk about the, you know, earlier we're talking about, you know, working on new positions. It's like, so when I, when I get on this position and I'm really obsessed with this and I say, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And I'm super obsessive about it. That's really positive. Right. But then when you get to those matches and you're obsessed about things, it really takes away from your performance. It creates anxiety. And so for him, you know, what he told me and this is, you know, what I was able to execute on is, don't think about it. If 
by the time I'm okay, listen, by the time it's two hours from the fight and I'm sitting in the locker room, everything that should have been done is already done or it's not done. And if it's not done, I got to live with it. I can't change it. I can't change it in the next hour and 59 minutes. It's either done or it's not done. And I got to let it go. I just got to relax and be in the moment and enjoy myself. And so that's kind of like where my head goes is not, but you know, I'm super obsessive by nature. And so figuring out ways to not be obsessive. And a lot of times that's just, you know, acting like the competition is not going to happen. Talking to my buddies about whatever it is I want to be talking about, you know, scrolling through Twitter, whatever it may, may be, but not obsessing over the competition. Yeah, I, I found that in working with so many elite athletes that, that's a, such a positive trait for becoming elite. But like you said, you, you're working to manage it. And do you have any memorable, like really memorable matches in your MMA career that were like exemplary of being able to either turn that off or where you maybe let it get the best of you a little bit? No, I mean, honestly, I feel like, so obviously not all of the MMA contests went my way. A lot, a lot of them did. But I feel like by the time I was in MMA, and this is what I'm saying, I think they say about wrestlers. By the time I went to MMA, I had thousands of opportunities to compete. And so my process was really, really, really well honed in. Like I was really locked into what I needed to do. And so I feel like all, yeah, you know, I only fought 21 times, but I feel like all 21 times I was ready to compete optimally because prior to that, I had thousands of rest matches to practice this process of getting ready to compete. And by the time I got to my MMA career, when I was, I think, 24, 25, I, I was ready. I was good. I knew how to do it. Did you use any kind of like like visualization, hypnosis, breath work or anything like that? Or was it kind of like just you kind of had it under control in your own way outside of that? Yeah, I was. Uh, no, I would say that mm, not not really any of that stuff. I mean, I would visualize outside of competition. I would think about the sport a lot. But, you know, right prior to it, there was none, none of that stuff. Gotcha. I was just curious. I, I feel yeah. like that's with like the mental stuff. I feel like there's definitely different you know, different people and, and different, you know, different strokes for different folks, so to speak. Uh, what were the, you, you mentioned those anxiety reducing t- uh, tactics though, like that, that, that coach helped you with, like, what were those specifically that he had mentioned? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of said it, but it was, it was literally just talking about stuff that, that wasn't the match, right? If I'm going, when I'm backstage in a fight, you know, talking to my buddy about the other fighter, talking huh. to my buddy about uh, the Bitcoin or right? <laughs> literally, literally, any, anything but the fight, anything else. And so, you know, at first, at first, that's going to feel very abnormal for most people. They're going to feel very strange about that because they should be focusing on this big match that's coming up, right? It's going to feel very strange, but it's really, for me, it, it's what makes me the most effective. Awesome. Uh, so last, last question for you here, Ben, is I know, I think you've talked about uh, studying like the profiles of the best, the best fighters. Yeah, and absolutely. we've probably talked about a lot of these concepts so far. But before we leave off, is what resonates with the, the top fighters in the industry? Uh, what are some of the constants and commonalities that define them? Man, yeah, I, I, th- I think we've talked about, about a lot of them. I, I would just say that, there, you know, don't be too stuck on one mental component as, a, as the thing that's going to get you to the top. Like, I, I just read this book. I, I won't name the author, but he's relatively famous. And it, it, the book pissed me off because it essentially said all you need to do is hard work to get to the top. And it's like, you're, you're literally lying to your readers right now. You're lying because there's going to be other things. You're going to need to deal with adversity. You're going to need to problem solve, right? And with the list can go on. If you're going to really get to the top, you're going to need to do a lot of things. Now, is, is, the, is quality A that you're talking about, is that important? Absolutely, it is. I would never argue with you that it's not. But is it the, the end all be all? And the answer to that is also no, right? You need these other things. And so I think, if you see fighters, a lot of them, and, and fighting forces you to do so, right? Because when, right, my first fight in the UFC, when I got slammed on my head and get punched in my face, it's like, well, that wasn't how I anticipated this to go down. And so now I need to bring out some other characteristics. I need to figure out how to deal with this adversity, right, in order to win this fight. You have to literally do it in real time. It can't just be one thing. It's got to be a multitude of things that are going to allow you to have the maximum amount of success. Awesome. Yeah, it's a... Uh... That, yeah, like I said, we, we definitely ta- chatted about a lot of them, but a lot of times it's just, mm-hmm. yeah, once that competition hits and man, I, I've, I've learned a ton. I feel like I've, I've you know, I, I almost, my mom almost signed me up for wrestling when I was a little oh, kid and now I'm like, oh, what would have been and what could I, how could I have grown mentally? It's, uh, it's just good knowing all these things and, and uh, 
just that unique the, the unique element that combat brings out too. So I, I learned a ton from you, Ben. I really appreciate your time. And uh, oh, I think you have an online uh, course, I believe, that you have out or is coming out. Do you want to yeah. explain that real quick? So yes, yeah, sir. I, I have a course out. Um, I actually have two courses. I there in two different places. I'm just kind of trying to figure out how to do this the right way. Um, so one would be benaskren.com. Uh, we put the first course that I did. It, it's on there. Just go to benaskren.com. You click on the mindset thing. Um, it talks about dealing with adversity, right? Something we talked about in the podcast. And that's where my first course is. My second course is on a website called Rockfin. And I actually have uh, other content on there. I have podcasts. I have blogs. I have a whole bunch of stuff on there. So that would be, and then obviously you can follow me on any social medias. And I'm just, I'm just at Ben Askren on all social medias. And then also on, on Rockfin, I have a lot of other mindset blogs. Uh, just written once and uh, you could check those out also. Fantastic. Well, hey, it was great chatting with you today, Ben. And yeah, I, I, good luck with your coaching academies and, and uh, you know, being one of the good guys out there with the direction of, of these youth and their long-term development. So I appreciate it, man. Awesome. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks for tuning into the show. We'll see you all next week with another great guest.